Today we have a great story for you. It is a story of a local legend, Winnie Ruth Judd, and it happened in October of 1931, right here in the Phoenix area. So welcome to Makeup and Murder Mondays. You guys, this is so crazy. I did my makeup, did my video, uh, went to go put the video together, and it's like there's a ghost on my video. It's really strange, but it's not watchable because what happens is I get into really slow, slow motion and I sound like a demon. So I've already done my makeup for today, but I still wanted to share the story with you, the story of Winnie Ruth Judd, as I shared. Um, she was known as the trunk murder or murderess, among other things. Um, she shot her two roommates, uh, hacked their body into pieces, and hid them into steamer trunks, which I really think we need to bring back into fashion, don't you? But not for the purposes of putting our friends in them. Um, anyway, she uh, is a local legend here in the Phoenix area. Um, this is a local case that happened in October of 1931. And um, she was actually surrendered, surrendered to police about a couple weeks later um, after she had killed uh, Agnes Ann Leroy, who was 32, and Hedvig Samuelson, who was 24. They were two uh, women who were friends. Um, and Winnie was a medical, um, worked in a medical center in Phoenix, in downtown Phoenix. Um, as a medical sec secretary. Her two friends had moved from Alaska. They were very close. Uh, they moved in together because Samuelson had contracted tuberculosis. And in Alaska, it was recommended that they move to Arizona for a drier climate, which they did. They all three became friends and um, ended up you know, hanging out a lot together. But according to police, on the night of October 16th, and this is from Murderpedia, um, which is a really great site if you've ever uh, feel the need to check it out. According to police, on the night of October 16th, 1931, Leroy and Samuelson were murdered by Judd after having a fight. Um, the three women were fighting over, reportedly, a man, um, a prominent businessman named John, AKA Happy Jack Halloran, um, who was 44, so quite a bit older than them. He was married also, um, and he was a friend with all three women. However, uh, apparently, whether or not they actually had relationships with this man, we don't know, except that it is reported that Winnie definitely did. Um, so he, uh, Winnie felt threatened or whatever, she killed the two victims. She shot them in their bungalow um, on 2nd Street, downtown Phoenix, and they were murdered. Then she had an accomplice who helped her dismember the bodies and put them in the trunks. And then she, two days after the murder, she took the trunks um, and boarded a, a train for California with the bodies in the trunk, on the train. Um, she also had her left hand, had a gunshot wound and it was bandaged. Um, she traveled overnight, got there in the morning. And then as soon as she got there, there was suspicion about the trunks because the trunks smelled badly. And apparently there were fluids escaping out of the trunks, which is really gross. Um, so thinking that maybe it had contraband, like a dead deer or something like maybe she'd been hunting, they flagged the trunks, tagged them and held them. Um, Judd's brother uh, picked her up from the train station unaware that she had been, you know, had committed a crime at all. He was totally unaware. And that afternoon, the LAPD um, came and they reported the murder or, and then in, at the same time, Arizona's finding out about the murders. Um, so across the headlines, they were, it was called many different things. Um, she was often referred to as Tiger Woman, the Blonde Butcher, um, but 
most famously the trunk murderess, murderess, which is really hard to say. So um, on uh, Monday evening, October 19th, the Phoenix police entered the bungalow, found what they thought was a crime scene um, that was missing some mattresses. So it's likely that the ladies were sleeping when they were killed. Um, but immediately, because I mean, this is what we do, right? Immediately the um, homeowners, the landlords, they put new, they put out ads in the newspapers. And back then we used to have the Arizona Republic, which came in the morning. And we would have the Phoenix Evening Gazette, which came in at night. And I am old enough to remember that, not 1931 old enough, but old enough to remember getting two papers, one in the morning and one at night. The owner put out these ads that anybody who wanted to tour the home of the crime scene could do so for 10 cents a person. Now, I know we think things in today's day and age are crazy and out of control and the world is just nuts, but think about that for a second. In 1931, for 10 cents, you could enter a crime scene and take a tour. That's just craziness. Anyway, um, the landlords, I guess, figured they couldn't rent it out, so they decided to let people take a tour. Whatever, I, I mean, I wouldn't do that, but okay. Um, police maintained, you know, that they were shot when they were asleep. They did find one of the mattresses miles away. Um, and the trial began and they ch decided to charge her with premeditation, um, because the relations between the three women had been deteriorating and because of the jealousy and the arguing over Jack, Happy Jack Halloran. Wonder if Happy Jack Road is named after him. Um, so, um, Judd's defense was that it was self-defense because she had the wound in her hand and she's like, I just shot them in self-defense. She did not take the stand. The jury found her guilty of first degree murder. Um, an appeal was unsuccessful. She was sentenced to be hanged on, in 1933, uh, went to the prison in Florence. Um, her death sentence was repealed after she was found mentally incompetent and sent to the Arizona State Hospital um, in 1933. Jack Halloran ended up, ha oh, Happy Jack didn't get away with nothing. He, I mean, well, he did, but he also was uh, arrested because it was suspected that he, because of the affair that he was having, that he possibly was her accomplice who cut them up. She actually testified and said against him and said that he it, the whole thing was his idea and that she just um, shot people in self-defense, that everything was his idea. Um, but they found he did not take the stand and they found um, him, they freed him and said that it would be, the state's case was inconsistent and they weren't sure that they could hold him for anything and that most likely it was all her own idea. Um, interestingly, after her death sentence was repealed, she was committed to the state's mental institution, Arizona State Hospital, in 1933. So, from 1933 to 1963, she escaped the institution six times, one time walking all the way to Yuma, walking all the way to Yuma. Um, another time, she escaped and was gone for six and a half years. She went to California, went to, um to San Francisco, got hired as a nanny and a, um, a live-in maid and spent six and a half years there before California figured out that she needed to be brought back to Arizona. Um, she ended up getting out of um, the mental institution, I believe. She, mm -mm, she got out in uh, let's see. She ended up being paroled and released on December 22nd, 1971. Um, and then she moved to California in 1983. The state of Arizona issued her an absolute discharge, meaning that she was no longer a parolee and she could basically do whatever she wanted. She died, um, October 23rd, 1998 at the age of 93. 67 years to the day from her surrender to police in 1931. So that is your local story for now. Let me know if you have any other ideas, drop them in the comments. I'm looking for local stories, I love them. Um, anything good, just let me know. And thank you for watching and stay beautiful. Next week I'll actually do my makeup.